Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing bradykinin-induced vasodilatation. Okay, so so far what we have seen is that bradykinin will activate these B2 receptors in the membrane of the endothelial cell. Uh, those B2 receptors will lead to the activation of IP3 production. IP3 will lead to these calcium waves uh, that are um, propagating across these endothelial cells. When calcium goes up in these calcium waves, what will happen is that calcium will bind to calmodulin to produce calcium-calmodulin complexes. Now, we want to see how these calcium-calmodulin complexes are going to activate ENOS enzymes. Okay, so let's just have a little bit of a revision about the structure of ENOS enzymes. Okay, right. So, ENOS which stands for epithelial nitric oxide synthase then. So this is epithelial nitric oxide synthase. Now, epithelial nitric oxide synthase, well, I'll just leave it as nitric oxide synthase, eh, not NOS. Uh, epithelial nitric oxide synthase, um, it occurs in homodimers. So the protein that, uh, the ENOS protein is not a functional enzyme on its own. Instead, what it needs to do is it needs to dimerize with another ENOS protein. So let me show this. So, if we denote a single ENOS protein like so, uh, where it has two domains, an oxygenase domain and a reductase domain over here. So, the amino terminus is somewhere over here. So let's have this here. So here's the amino terminus. And here's the carboxylic acid terminus of the protein. So this is our ENOS protein, and this portion up here, which I've denoted as a circle, is the oxygenase domain of our protein. So this is the oxygenase domain, okay? And this portion down here, which I've denoted as a rectangle, is the reductase domain of our protein. Now, on its own, this is not a functional enzyme which can create nitric oxide synthase. Instead, um, what it needs to do is it needs to dimerize with another one, basically, which I'll show like so. So, let me draw out another ENOS protein here. So here's another reductase domain, basically, and here's another oxygen domain, oxygenase domain here. So it has its amino terminus over here, NH2, and its carboxyl terminus over here. And how should I denote this? Um, um, I, I'll have to just draw it out, otherwise I'll end up trying to write coup backwards, and then it just looks awful. Right, there we go, there's its carboxyl terminus. Now, uh, let me um, colour these bits in. So, in the reductase domain we'll have in pink here, okay? And, so this is the pink here, okay? And the oxygenase domain we'll have in blue here. Okay, now, the important thing to understand is that once they formed this homodimer like this, so this is a homodimer, so this is a homodimer, once they have formed this homodimer, uh, they, um, they, 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 they do have, you ha this homodimer has two functional enzymes in it now. This here is a functional nitric oxide synthase. So this portion here, this, is a functional nitric oxide synthase enzyme now. This is capable of working to produce nitric oxide, and this bit over here is also a functional nitric oxide synthase. So, basically, what I'm trying to say is that the original ENOS protein, it had the two portions that it needed to um, produce nitric oxide. The problem was that they were in the wrong uh, conformation relative to each other. They weren't in the right spatial orientations to interact with each other properly. So what you have to do is you have to form these homodimers where you get two of them together and then they sort of fit nicely complementary to one another. And you get the reductase domain in the right orientation uh, with the oxygenase domain. And now they can basically work together to synthesize nitric oxide. Now, this oxygenase domain has some very important binding domains. So here, this square that I'm drawing off the side here, which I'll color in in green, this green square is a prosthetic heme group. Okay, 
So we'll just look at the structure of one of these. We'll ignore the other one now. So we're looking at it's the same in the other case. So this here is a prosthetic heme group. So you've stuck on a heme group, in effect, to um, this oxygenase domain of this NOS free or an ENOS protein. Prosthetic heme group. Heme group. And uh, this is the British English spelling of heme. The American English spelling of heme is H-E-M-E, -E, like that. Okay, and I should also say that epithelial NOS, or endothelial NOS, as it's probably more correctly called, um, is also known as NOS-free, nitric oxide synthase free. And that should have been endothelial NOS, not epithelial NOS. Endothelial NOS. Okay. Right, so, um, the important thing is that this oxygenase domain has this prosthetic heme group stuck on the side of it, and that's going to be important in the reaction that's going to be catalyzed, basically. Okay, it also has a domain uh, known as the BH4 binding domain here, so this is where the uh, cofactor BH4 binds, and BH4 stands for tetrahydrobioturin, uh, tetra hydrobioturin, hydrobioturin, okay, um, and tetrahydrobioturin binds somewhere near where the prosthetic heme group binds, okay, then on this reductase domain you have a number of really important binding domains, okay, so I'll divide them into two. So you have a binding site for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate that is reduced, so NADPH, or reduced NADP. So this is reduced NADP binding site, anyway. The reduced NADP, which stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. So I'll write this out. Nicotinamide tinamide, adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Adenine dinucleotide nucleotide phosphate, or NADP for short, and um, basically this is where this uh, molecule binds to the reductase domain, and we're going to see that when uh, we actually look at the uh, nitric oxide synthesis reaction, we're going to need a reduced NADP to come in and provide the electrons that are going to um, reduce the oxygen. Okay, so this is reduced NADP binding site here. Okay, now you then have another binding site here. So this binding site here is for uh, a molecule known as flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is very important in the respiration reactions. Okay, so this is um, flavin adenine dinucleotide, the same one that you met in, um, in the Krebs cycle. Flavin adenine dinucleotide, FAD dinucleotide. So basically, what's going to happen is when NADPH binds here, you're going to ju you're going to give up your electrons to flavin adenine dinucleotide, and then it's going to pass them on to the next thing that will bind over here, which is the flavin mononucleotide binding site. So FMN. So basically, you have these three binding sites where uh, these um, molecules that are capable of being in an oxidized and reduced state are all going to bind. So in will come the reduced NADP. It will pass on the electrons to the flavin adenine dinucleotide, which will then pass them on to the flavin mononucleotide. So where should I write this? FMN stands for flavin mononucleotide. And then finally, flavin mononucleotide will pass them onto the heme group over here, which will then pass them onto oxygen, which will be bound to the heme. Okay, mononucleotide. Right, so this is the structure of NOS free or ENOS, and we'll come back to its function later on. Um, now, what I want to discuss is where is it going to be localized in uh, the cell? Well, actually, what we find is that it's um, it's positioned in the cell membrane, and indeed, the reason for this is that it has myristoil, uh, myristic acid groups or myristoil groups, and palmitic acid or palmitoil groups bound to its amino terminus, which allow it to um, allow it to insert into the cell membrane. Okay, so 
let me just draw a picture of this. If you have the cell membrane here, and if this is your ENOS enzyme, which will now draw like this, so this is ENOS, okay, or NOS free, uh, then basically there are uh, long chain uh, carboxylic acid groups that are anchoring it in the membrane. So I'll draw the phospholipid bio there here. Okay, and these long chain carboxylic acid groups that have been attached onto the ENOS, they are palmitoyl groups, palmitoyl groups, palmitoyl groups, and myristoyl groups. So, myristoyl groups. So, I'll just give you a little bit of insight into what that actually means. Okay, so uh, myristoyl groups, then we'll begin with. Myristoyl groups are uh, where you've added myristic acid onto things. So let me tell you what myristic acid is. So myristic acid. Okay, so myristic acid is a 14 carbon carboxylic acid. So let me draw it here. Here's the carboxylic acid. And I don't want to have to draw out 12 methylene groups. So there's a trick, basically, to get out of having to do a lot of work. So what you can instead do is you can draw one methylene group. You can put brackets around it like this, and then put a 12 down there to denote, copy this out 12 times if you want to. And then on the end, you just have to then put the methyl group, which isn't a methylene group. So you can't just put 13 there. It wouldn't be correct, basically. Okay, I suppose you could put 13 and then you could just have a hydrogen sticking off, but it's more conventional to draw the methyl group out separately. Okay, so that's myristic acid, and as I said, it's a 14 carbon carboxylic acid. So you have two carbons here and then 12 in there, that's overall 14. Palmitic acid, which is the group that you are also adding on to the uh, amino terminus of these oxygenase domains of the ENOS proteins. Palmitic acid. This is a 16 carbon carboxylic acid. So again, if this is the carboxylic acid group here, then this is the methylene group here. Okay, and this time we're going to have 14 of these. So we'll draw brackets around it again, put 14 there, and then we'll have our methyl group off the end. So that's the structure of palmitic acid. It's a 16 carbon carboxylic acid. So basically what you do is you stick these onto uh, the side chains of uh, the ENOS protein near the amino terminus of it. And this means that you have these long chain carboxylic acid tails, which are very hydrophobic, sticking off the end of the protein. And that allows uh, well, it means that these long-chain carboxylic acid tails can implant into the phospholipid bilayer, and they mean that the, uh, the ENOS protein is basically held or suspended or tethered at the plasma membrane, like so. Okay, so that's one way in which you can get ENOS to be... Um, to be suspended at the plasma membrane, okay? And specifically, as we've seen in a separate video, it localizes in the caviole specifically and binds to the protein caviolin 1. Right, okay, so another way it can be localized at the membrane, another bit of evidence for how it can be localized at the membrane, is you can actually have it bound to the B2 receptor. So if this is the B2 receptor, the receptor that we were eventually long ago stimulated with, um, with um, bradykinin, well, basically, it's, you can often find that it's actually physically bound to this carboxyl terminus of the B2 receptor. So this is B2 here. And you can find that ENOS is bound here. So how do you do this? How, do you, how did they find that ENOS was bound to this B2 receptor? Well, basically, what they did is they took an antibody to the B2 receptor and they put the antibody on, let's say, the well of some plate. So uh, where should we put this? So they, they put, let's say this is a glass plate here. What they did is they loaded onto the glass plate an antibody here, which binds to this B2 receptor. Okay, so it binds to the B2 receptor, so let's draw the B2 receptor here. Okay, and if the B2 is linked to ENOS, what you will get is you'll get some ENOS linked here. So the ENOS will also be linked to the plate, basically, with the B2 receptor. Okay, this is what's known as co-precipitation. All you then have to do is wash off, and that will remove anything that hasn't actually bound to the antibody. 
okay? And then, if you find the enos still there afterwards, that indicates that the enos must have been bound to the B2 receptor, which was then bound to the antibody. Otherwise, enos would have been washed away, basically. So, that sort of an experiment is known as co-precipitation, because the enos was co-precipitated with the B2 receptor. So, this is co Precipitation. So we found by co-precipitation studies, precipitation, precipitation, I think it is, precipitation, there we go, um, co-precipitation, we found that enos is bound to the intracellular aspect of the B2 receptor, so that's another way it can uh, be held at the plasma membrane. Okay, uh, now, uh, what happens next? How does calcium actually activate this uh, enos uh, enzyme? Well, we'll see that in the next video.